but, but yeah, yeah I'm, I'm on, on a Microsoft, Microsoft surface, surface, and then so it's just it's just, just open, open in my lap. lap. Like, like that's, that's gonna, gonna happen. happen. I, I my, my cats, cats agree, agree with, with you. you. That works. Nope, nope. That, that's, that's fine. fine. Uh, do, do I need, need to open up, up the stream to um, see, see them, them, or are you going to just, just call them out? out? Nobody can hear me right okay. now. There we go. I just re realized I didn't set up the audio. Um, I'm hearing uh, music in my ear, though. You're hearing that, your music. Uh, or is that me? I think that's you. It's I don't. I don't me. have any music. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have something running in the background? Uh. What is that? I mean, I don't hear your music though, so at least it's not popping through on the on the stream or on the recording. Hopefully. And now you're just fuzzy. Are you blocking your camera on purpose? Oh. No. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm trying to figure out where that music is coming from. I thought it was you. Nope. Our uh, our stream folks say they, they don't hear the music. Don't say it, boss. Oh, it was one of my son's tabs open from his math uh, <laughs> virtual school. Yep, that would do it. Mm, sorry about that. It was like adventure music. I thought maybe it was like a it sounded like D and D music. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was not us. Maybe we should have background music to to fill in the the pauses, but then it would be hard to edit for for Sam and Aaron when they edit it. I, I think I think Aaron could use a good hard mode. <laughs> yeah, you think so? <laughs> yeah. Just, just tell him I said that making me sound halfway intelligible is obviously getting, it's too, getting too easy, easy for him. <laughs> uh, I try not to um, overly burden the, the folks who uh, are dramatically underpaid if they were con to consider this any sort of a job, so... See how you get the light on that. Yeah, kind of okay. All right, shall we uh, do this for real then? I think we uh, shall. Yeah, let's. Let me hit record on the audio for the podcast, folks. All right, get all my various windows open. I really need a. At least a bigger screen, if not a, if not a two-screen setup, so I could watch the stream on one screen and the script over here and the recording over there, and there's too much stuff to watch. Okay, and I am hosting solo because Tracy doesn't have a copy of the book yet because they send me the review copies, and then I have to turn around and go get to the mailbox in a, during a pandemic uh, and send her. Uh, usually I send her the special uh, special uh, cover, though, so at least she gets that. So, let's get going. 
This episode of the Tome Show is brought to you by SkullSplitterDice.com and listeners like you. Thanks for using the Tome's Amazon and DM's Guild affiliate links and to our patrons at Patreon.com slash The Tome Show. Welcome to The Tome, a D&D news, reviews, and interviews show, and I'm your Tome host, Jeff Greiner. And in this surprise round, we'll be th- throwing, or we'll be trying very hard to, to stay warm while, while the goddess of ice sort of freezes the world and... Uh, as we do our sort of first look here at Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Our guides are expert survivalists who will definitely not lead us to our frozen deaths. Certainly, we can't assume that they are inexperienced in Arctic survival just because they both happen to live in the American South, which seldom has temperatures below freezing. First off, we have the newbie DM, a longtime stalwart of the gaming community, my friend and yours, the best knucklehead trout fisherman in the world. It's Enrique Bertrand. <laughs> How are you, Jeff? Thank you for having me on. I am doing lovely. I, I love having uh, the, the newbie DM who has been DMing for over decades at this point uh, on all the time. If if Twitter had a way to change your name every five years, then <laughs> right, I <laughs> I take advantage. You of you it. you've built a brand now. You can't just not be the newbie DM at this point. Uh, alas, it is what it is. But but really, thank you for thank you for inviting me. I'm I'm glad to be here. And Brandis, uh, nice to meet you. First time we're on a podcast together. Oh, spoiler: so, I haven't introduced Brandis yet. <laughs> oh, well, sorry, my bad. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, secondly, we have the Tome Show's uh, D&D historian in residence from Tribality, Edition Wars, and more. The only person I know who's cuter and more deadly than a gnome ceramorph. Surprise, surprise, it's Brandis Stoddard. That got weird, didn't it? <laughs> it weird? I'm very happy to be here tonight. I, I can promise that you will not get a frosty reception or a snow ooh, job. Ooh, ooh, there you go. Did you prepare those puns in advance? I did, thank oh. you. I'm a professional <laughs> podcaster, my friend. Professional. professional. Oh, I've been doing it uh, a very long time, and I don't consider myself professional. Well, that's because you're going for the Olympics. Oh, okay, <laughs> that makes sense. So, in this episode, we're going to be talking about Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, the latest D and D adventure from Wizards of the Coast. We're discussing this very shortly after the book has become widely available, as we do in our surprise round uh, episodes. Um, but we, all three of us, received early review copies, so consider this our f- full disclosure. All of us are working from free copies that I'm pretty sure in all of our cases also came with a bunch of swag, like dice and, and um, notebooks, and, and I think in Enrique's case, a really cool cloth map that I'm kind of jealous of. Yeah, so, it was, it's so, a cloth uh, the scarf. scarf. Uh, the scarf, yeah. yeah. The scarf. Uh, I don't know about you, gentlemen, but uh, my wife has already claimed that for her own. Oh, so you got one too? Somehow, I, I am not on the the um, the best list, I guess, for review stuff. Um, ah, the, the diamond, <laughs> the platinum diamond extreme, platinum extreme. Yes, that's right. With two X's, you need the two <laughs> that's X's right. for, to get the scar. Okay, well, I guess I can't complain too much. Oh, Enrique is getting it out for the folks on the stream. It's it's huge. And, oh yeah, yeah, it's I've huge seen and really right. cool. Yeah, I think it's about five feet long and about a, a two, it's like two by five maybe. Right. Right? Although it it does occur to me of all of the the things they have to turn into maps that you can you know that's cloth that you can hang up or whatever uh, and show off. Like the Icewind Dale map is has a lot of like empty space in it with not a lot going on, right? Yeah. Well, but they it's not the only map they sent us since there's also a map in the book. And a map in the special edition of the book, and a map of the dice. Right, set. there's lots of maps floating around. Lots of maps. So, yeah, very good. But, but the, getting the that scarf took me right back to uh, Ultima Online and a uh, you know cloth map feely uh, tucked ooh, in the box. The, the best part of it is that here in Miami, I have a lot of use for a scarf. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, as I mentioned, this is a surprise round episode. This is where you get our first impressions very quickly after the book has been released with the understanding that we have not done a deep dive sort of read through of the book at this point. We definitely haven't played it. Um, and, and then we can sort of, as a, as a you know, the, then the Tome Show can kind of take our time getting a deeper review later 
where folks have had a chance to play through the book and then and then be able to have a, a whole different insight than we've been able to give in the past. So so we've split it up that way and hopefully that works. Uh, before we dive in, I want to thank our sponsor, uh, SkullSplitterDice.com. They make some fantastic dice of all sorts. You've heard the ads uh, in the past and they have a coupon code, The Tome Show, that will get you 15% off your first order. This is the last month of contest from them. So if you want a chance to win a fantastic bundle of dice and dice accessories this month, uh, includes premium dice, metal dice. There's a tray. There's a their new newly uh, kickstarted skull shaped mug with horns uh, and other stuff all in, in this month's bundle. Uh, you're gonna want to follow us on Twitch by going to twitch.tv slash Tome Show. Uh, those of you that are watching this right now have your opportunity to be entered. If you're following us, you're already going to be entered by the at the end of the month. Uh, and then at some point during this episode, I am going to ask if there are questions from people watching the stream. And if you ask a question about the book uh, during the stream, we'll answer not only answer your question, but I will jot down your username and you will get another entry into the contest. So wait for that moment. Start hoarding your questions. Uh, you can only be entered once per stream, so don't like ask a whole bunch of questions just to get a bunch of entries, right? Um, but have your questions ready to go. Okay, now on to Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Uh, those on the stream, we've been holding up the covers uh, as we have them. Uh, so yeah, I guess the first question I have is... Um, what what is this? What what do we think of this book? What what is it about? What's going on here? Who wants to start us off? So I'll start. Well, me. Please do. I I think it's a great setting book with a pretty cool adventure attached to it. Hmm. Talk about that because that's not necessarily like it doesn't feel like more of a setting book than. A lot of the previous adventures where we had a big setting st section of Chalt and a big setting section on Waterdeep or on uh, Baldur's Gate or whatever. Uh, is it more of a setting book to you than that? I, I think I feel almost equal parts setting and adventure with a whole bunch of adventure hooks and a whole bunch of mini adventures thrown in into the setting for good measure. The adventures happen to tie back for the most part to the main core storyline but mm -hmm. i'm sure you could take those adventures and and strip them of whatever tie they have to the to the core story and you have yourself a nice big setting with a lot of adventures and a lot of adventure locations that you could run without ever having to talk about the rise of the the rhyme of the frost mm. that that's, that was my first impression of the book when i read through it i think i agree with that i think that um chapter two in particular, the one that's Icewind Dale outside mm -hmm. of Ten Towns uh, really shows a lot of the depth of what the region has to offer. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's one of the sections I've read most heavily in the book so far, and it's it's highly varied and uh, doing a lot of different things in in terms of what the adventure is, what the task is, what it relates to, but it's a region with one central problem at the start of this adventure, and so a lot of things are going to find a way to touch back into that central problem, mm -hmm. right? So, like, um, the adventure first takes you through all of these towns, and the idea is that they're going to kind of each have a quest for you while you're also pursuing maybe one, one other meta quest. Well, that's a setting, because mm -hmm. uh, whatever Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide may have led you to believe, settings should have conflict and problems mm -hmm. that heroes should solve. And this does that. So in that way, it's a great setting book. But I said the same about Baldur's Gate. It was a great setting book for Baldur's Gate. It would be nice if more of the adventure had happened there. <laughs> well, and, but, and and it's a great setting book for Baldur's Gate, and that's not the case here uh, because the adventure does take place in, the, like, like you say, it's a setting book, but it's not a setting. It doesn't handle the setting parts in the same way that those other books that I mentioned handled setting, because those other books would be like, 
here's the story that takes place in the setting, and then there'd be like a final chapter or an appendix at the end of the book with just nothing but lore and nothing but setting. This sort of sure. laces the setting throughout the chapters, and each but each chapter is to, like there's not a, just an Icewind Dale setting section. It's a whole bunch of setting with the story and the narrative of what's going on laced throughout it. Is that sure? Sure, I, I agree. It's maybe more sort of interwoven than other setting books. That doesn't make it not a setting book, and that doesn't make it any weaker as a, a setting book or an adventure. Those are, mm. those are actually both strengths right there to me. I, I think it ties back to presentation and a change in presentation. Mm -hmm. I think this changes the way that we've been uh, given settings in the past, and it also changes the way we've been given adventures in the mm -hmm. past, and it creates a whole new format, I think. And I think what they did was take best practices from the, from the essentials box and said, okay, here's a great way to present adventures. Here, here's a great format for introducing a location and the adventures that happen in this location let's take it now a step further and put it in a hardcover book and i think that's what they did with this book and i think they took some of the best practices from that product and introduced it here and i think it works really okay. well yeah i was because I was, because it almost feels like i mean they're going through the what is it seven chapters of of the story of the narrative of this adventure and they're just making each chapter or at least what the first two chapters also very setting rich um and i'm curious like clearly enrique you're a fan um but is this like are, are you the kind of person who's ever going to pick up a book and be like well i don't care about this adventure but i want to i want to run a game in in Baldur's gate or in icewind dale or whatever like you don't have that just pull out section that you can just call the setting is that problematic, or is it still going to be, you think, just as easy to pull out the things you need for your own generic Icewind Dale story? So uh, I'll give you a real-world scenario. I'm, I'm actually going to run, in my current campaign, a part of this book as part of the campaign. So my answer would be mm -hmm. yes. I'm going to strip some of the things I do plan to use for my game and leave some of the things I'm not on the mm -hmm. wayside. Because I think the book does a really good job of being modular enough that you can mm. do something like that. So I'll, I'll let you know how it goes because I, I plan to right. do it. Well, and I think especially in those first two chapters, the the first couple of chapters are very much a, like, here's your enclosed sandbox. Run around, do your things. You, you know, uh, it almost it almost comes off in my, in my experience. Like chapter one comes off maybe a little bit trite <laughs> in the way it's like, you know, you run to this town, you do a few quests, you go to this town, you do a few quests, you go to this town, and you sort of hop through the ten towns of ten towns, right? And, and meet them all and do a few quests or, or accomplish a thing in each one. Uh, but it also makes it, like you said, very modular. Like you could, you could strip out any of those and just leave out the sort of flavor of, oh, yeah, and there's this big thing kind of going on in the background the whole time because none of them or very few of them really rely on that too heavily. Um, that you couldn't just use it for anything. It, it definitely puts me in mind of, you know, starter zones in an MMO, but in a fairly good way, not the maybe very negative way that that might mm. sound. Um, it just makes me think of like my time actually designing starter zones in MMOs back when I did that kind of okay. thing. Uh, in terms of how the, the places are presented and how they function as quest hubs and how they're supposed to deliver characterization for the whole region and all, all that kind of thing. But even beyond that, I think that uh, chapters uh, three through seven are also sort of adventures and, and dungeons that you could probably find a way to deliver self-contained oh, yeah. without um, without even invoking a lot of the rest of the story of Aurel and the Realm of the Frostmaid. Mm -hmm. No, if, if anything, um, my... I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it would be incredibly easy to take any one of these and pull them out and do your own thing with them. And if I have any concerns, again, having not read it because it's really early days yet, 
uh, if I have any concerns, it's that the narrative that ties it all together isn't as clear or as strong. Like, it's not like, you know, uh, when you're looking at Tomb of Annihilation, like, the larger meta story is really clear and drives the PCs from the beginning, right? Here, it's a little bit less so. Like, the larger meta narrative is kind of happening, but it's kind of in the background, and they're they're around, and they're kind of doing their thing. Um, and eventually, they they start, you know, they level up enough, and they get powerful enough that they start interacting with the larger meta story a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, my, 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 like, the modularness of it is actually... Um, probably so great that I'm, I'm more concerned about the work I'll have to do as a DM to tie it all together and make it, make it flow. That... Right. I, like, looking at the, the flow chart on page nine, and I, I like that there's a flow chart on page nine to make it more readily navigable. Um, it clearly, uh, chapter three, Sunblight, and chapter four, Destruction's Light, are they're a side effect of the main story. Mm -hmm. They aren't the main story. Right. Um, like, one thing that gets into my skin just a tiny bit in um, the early going of, uh, I want to say it's chapter one, uh, you meet uh, an NPC who, um, okay, so this is on page 43, um, you meet um, Hethel Arkoran, who is um, a soothsayer who tells you about th these things you are going to have to do and uh, all these other things that are going on um, with uh, Zardarok Sunblight. And she kind of hangs a lampshade on the fact that you need to level up <laughs> before you go take him on. And, I don't know, we all know it's a reality of a game with an advancement right. track. But... I still kind of hate it. <laughs> that sense of, well, I have to let the bad guy go be a bad guy for a little while longer because I haven't gained enough levels. That's not valid in character logic. That doesn't work because you should be able to oppose him somehow, even if you can't take him on directly. But that's not how the adventure works. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Okay. Um, are you okay? Can we talk a little bit? Can we talk a little bit about how they kind of bury the lead here with, with the story uh, uh, behind, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden? Yes. Um, because I I do feel that they're selling you a story, and it sort of pivots into something else that it's like wow, almost like we got two different things going on here. Like like the way it pivots um, at the end, or or which pivot are you talking about? So, I mean, I don't know how much into spoilers you got. We're going to assume normally. that if people are, are listening to and watching to this, that they're okay with being spoiled a little bit. Okay, so so I'm referring specifically to the idea that you, you go into the story thinking that it's about uh, the eternal winter in, in Icewind mm -hmm. Dale, right? And then suddenly the story takes a, a, a whole curveball angle here where you're finding a ancient nethery city buried in the right. snow and that's really the and and you know the the end of the story and whether or not you deal with the frost maiden is almost irrelevant mm -hmm. uh, to an extent yeah no that that um, oh, that struck me as um a strange like the, the the even the motivation to find this old nethery city like i don't i'm not sure i get why you even need to go there the Right, like, why would the PCs be interested in that? To me, is a little. To me, is a little right. odd. And two, I, 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 almost wonder if, if we're gonna deal with a situation, and I haven't run it yet, so I, I can't say. But one of the issues I had with Tomb of Annihilation, for example, was this huge shift in tone from the stuff hanging out in the, you know, happening in the jungle mm -hmm. or whatever, and suddenly you go into this tomb, this death trap tomb, and it was kind of like a shift in. And, and tone and expectations. Mm -hmm. But 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 um, even more so, like, I don't even... I don't know how much I'm concerned about a major shift in tone because at least the, the Netherese city doesn't feel like 
a major like it doesn't feel like you're going from let's go explore to death trap dungeon we're gonna kill you right um <laughs> no i don't mean it but that so way. i don't feel like it has that break it's just, it just has a break in the story like it's as if, it's as right. if tomb of annihilation was a story about exploration uh, and then, oh, you stumbled on this dungeon, which is the entire second half of the book, although you have no real strong reason to want to go there. Like, Two of Annihilation at least gives you the motivation to go into the dungeon. Um, I'm not sure that, that the narrative, the, the larger story, because the big problem is that Oral, the Frost Maiden, has, has, is, is blanketed the, the region in, in Eternal right. Winter. But that's chapter five. There's still two chapters of, of, the, of adventure after that. <laughs> And, and what does chapter three and four, in all honesty, have to do with anything in chapters five and six? Sure. No, well, it's, I mean, honestly, what does chapters one and two have to do with it? It's all just time killing and leveling up until you get to, oh, now we can deal with the problem, which I think is what Brandis was previously uh, commenting on. Well, well right. Like, uh, chapters three and four are a problem that is exploiting the fact that Aurel has right. done this, right? Like, the Dwergar can take action because there's no sunlight to get in their way. Well, okay. Like, that, that tracks to me. Sure. That, that sounds like something that they would do. Uh, it isn't helping you beat the Frost Maiden, right. but it is protecting the region from a, a, a very real problem. Yeah. Um, and, and I, like, I, ha- I haven't read Chapter 5 in depth, and so it was only now that I was really coming to understand that um, you're absolutely right about sort of, oh yeah, you, you really might have solved the problem by the end of chapter, end of chapter 5. You know, maybe. Um, but what, I'm, what I kind of take from it is that uh, the GM needs to be well, pardon the maybe sort of contrasting um, metaphor here, but it needs to be building heat with the party <laughs> against the Arcane Brotherhood wizards, um, especially, um, what's-her-name, Harpel. Right. Um, and if and if that was like, laced into chapters one through four, that that, that heat was there, right. and that it was being foreshadowed that this Netheris thing is a thing, and that the Arcane Brotherhood is a thing, and that you're going to have to deal with that, then I think you'd have a cohesive flow of a story uh, that I'm just not quite sure is here. Well, right. I mean, you definitely have to go to Chapter 5. And then um, you should I, I get the um, Valian Harpel there. And you should have also encountered Avarice at some point before then. Mm-hmm. Um, then the other two members of the Arcane Brotherhood are a problem if you decide that you want them to be. But otherwise, I mean, dude, they're super dead. Right. Well, and and having them pop up is one thing. That's a neat little yeah. cameo or whatever. But it doesn't yeah. mean like, and they're doing something horrible, or they're hunting for something, and you need to get there first, or like it doesn't build that drive necessarily. Right, right. And, and so, like the way to accomplish that using the Arcane Brotherhood would be to have it, it would be to make it personal, like to really lean right. into. Okay, fine. We're going to Ithran because. We just hate her so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ithrin is, is the name of the the Netheris necropolis, as they call it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the crashed Netheris city, which, by the way, is an awesome idea for a, a adventure location. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, no. A, the, a plus. That is good at arcane age content, and I'm it, here for it. it. It's like we were discussing earlier. Like I think, I'm I am re- I, I think I'm generally happy with every piece of this in a modular sense, right? Yeah. It, it just doesn't have the connective tissue that I want from a published adventure that's driving me from one thing to the next. It, and and it's, not a, it's not a new problem. I'm running through um, Descent into Avernus with my kids right now, and those early chapter, that first chapter particularly of Descent into Avernus has a similar problem. It just doesn't, you know... There's not a lot of drive to take you from one section to the next section to where you, what you need and, and do the things you need to do to get to chapter two, uh, in some yeah, cases. Yeah, for I, sure. I, I think what this adventure does that Avernus doesn't do, and I had a lot of problems with Avernus, um, and I've been pretty public about it, but I, I think this adventure does a good thing in that regard, is that it, it makes you make characters that are tied 
to Ten Towns and the setting and make you care about all these things happening in Ten Town, whether there's connective tissue or not, at the end of the day, right. you probably care about them because you're from here and you want to see your community safe, right? At least, you know, I, I'm thinking that's the that's the thinking. In Avernus, yeah. in Avernus, they make you create characters from Baldur's Gate and then suddenly you have to give a damn about El Toro. Right. And that and that's where I thought there was a little bit of a weakness in descending to Avernus because you're asking me to care about a city I'm not a part of. Well, my very my very easy solution to that was fine, everybody make characters you're from El Toro. You're all hell riders. Go. Oh yeah. You know. <laughs> that, that was that was the homebrew solution, but that should have really been in the book. You sure, probably. I'm saying. Yeah, no, absolutely because I find myself like having to figure even in in Avernus like you have a bunch of new backgrounds or new takes on backgrounds specific to Baldur's Gate. That suddenly it's like, yeah, but we're in El Toro, which is, has a very different feel, a di very different city. Those backgrounds don't really fit. So if you want to take one, we have to sort of be like, okay, you're from El Toro, but you've been hanging out in Baldur's Gate a lot, I guess. I don't know, right? And so you have to kind of squint and, and fudge the lines and make it work. But uh, yeah, but but this book, um, it, it sticks closer to to a singular sort of region that that has relatively similar feels so you can build characters that are connected to the setting in in a better way in many ways i i kind of feel like this adventure part of the reason it is a little more disjointed in my head is i feel like it is a natural sort of evolution to a larger campaign from the way they designed the was it the essentials um set um, that adventure um, that I believe uh, Enrique, you and um, and Mike Shea ran through, yeah. right? Uh, and so I feel like, and, and that was also very much like, here's the setting, and here's a bunch of people and things you might care about and whatever. But it was also a lot of really like small modular things that were kind of related to this larger meta arc because this thing came happened and. Um, created problems that led to all kinds of different issues for you to solve. So in, in a lot of ways, this feels like that kind of design model taken to a 1 to 11 campaign instead of the, the just this beginning first few levels campaign. Yeah, they took best practices from that box and they certainly, they applied it. Um, it, it it's very evident, you know, when you start seeing the adventure structure and the way they structure the the starting quests and um, the the choices you get to make there, I think it's pretty clear that, like I said, it's a new format, and I think it works really well for what it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you're you're on a you're on a at the end of the day, by the time you get to the main to the main storyline, yes, you're on rails, but you went through a bunch of different roads, you know, a bunch of different train tracks to get to the main track at the end of the story, sure. which is fine. You know that that's a that's a perfectly valid you know perfectly good good way to structure yeah a, a campaign I, I think it works really well it's it's probably one of my preferred ways to structure a campaign um, but I also like to have that that larger arc that that main track at the end like I want it to be clear that all the other side tracks that you're on are leading to that track you know so that, that it, it feels yeah. like it's aiming in the same direction so okay so I okay, go ahead. It just feels like to me, it's just a weird. Again, it's just like a weird choice. I don't. I don't. I think some of these chapters might be out of order in this book, <laughs> and yet, and yet they're not. Right. You know, and it's and I'm. I don't know. I, I think it's a it's 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 a weird choice. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just saying it's it's an odd. Well, choice. ultimately, we don't know if it works because none of us have well, none of us have played it, it, right? <laughs> so, That's true. Um, so we'll see. Um, now, one of my other questions. I think we've we've harped on this on this topic enough um one of my other questions is they've built this book very heavily as uh sort of a an arctic horror type of story uh and there's even a sidebar as i as i'm already open to page nine with uh the the flow chart that uh brandis loves and i put flow chart in quotes because in my mind a flow chart doesn't it's not just one path by definition, a flowchart has flows in different ways, but that's that's a semantics issue. <laughs> well, so, so chapter one and chapter two don't have any definite path. No, all. but the flowchart right. the, the flowchart is containing, the flowchart is just a summary of the chapters. <laughs> the flowchart is just a summary of chapters. There's no paths to follow. It's just go from chapter one to two to three to four. 
I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> well, there were previous uh, uh, Storm King's Thunder had a real flow chart where it branched off and you saw the different paths and how they come together and converge and loop around and do their things, right? Right, r- right. A clear signal that much of the content in this book will not be sure. used. Yes, sure, I, absolutely. I, I did hear about my that. my quibble is just that they use the word flow chart because I don't, <laughs> and, which again is is semantic and not important and kind of a stupid thing for me to harp on. Um, but right right next to it, my point was is that there's this little sidebar about how. Uh, the adventure is about horror in the far north, right? I don't know that I go through this and I necessarily get a a horror vibe from this story at all. Um, and I'm curious what what your takes uh, were looking at it. Well, I mean, right off the bat, it is one of the first serious discussions of like role playing safety that we've seen in an official release from Watsi. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a lot of the, the big publishers, uh, uh, most of all Watsi, don't actually discuss that much in their books. Um, but this is using the, the language and um, terminology that the gaming community has developed over the last, uh, let's call it 10 years of discussion of safety uh, so that now it's acknowledged this is pretty necessary. Sort of whether this is a actually a horror campaign or not, maybe the, the label on the sidebar is off, but the sidebar itself is good. No, I, I agree, but but my larger issue isn't just the label on the sidebar. My They have been yeah. promoting this book, and I've been seeing people in Facebook groups and whatever – uh, you know, centered around this book, talking about how excited they are to get into a horror campaign, and I'm not, I'm not seeing that they're going to be satisfied <laughs> here. But I, but I might be wrong because we've all, you know, we've all just had initial impressions here. So tell, tell me if you've seen something I'm missing. I I um, don't I don't see the horror. Well, so I think that in the Caves of Hunger, um, chapter six, um, is supposed to be pretty horror focused uh, there's a table of psychic hauntings um, there's an old vampire uh, named uh, Tekeli Lee um, which is a um, reference back to Edgar Allan Poe of all things but uh, you know, here we go um, well and I almost, I and almost get the get, get the impression they're going for more of like a almost a Lovecraftian style horror. There's something buried in the ice sort of thing. I just don't know that they played it up enough for me to get that feeling from the from the story. Right. I think that's a, I think it's a fair point. I mean, there is section H31, which I've just had the good fortune to open to on page 227. Uh, it's called Thing in the Ice. So that's promising. I don't know what it... Yeah, right. Okay. Something beyond mortal comprehension exists partially inside the wall of ice and partially within some other mm-hmm. distant, horrific demiplane. I mean, they're certainly going for it. Right. Does it land? I mean, I, we established that I can't tell you that. Right. My, I just, I just um, the parts that I've looked at in more detail, it certainly feels like every now and then they go for it. I just don't know that they go for it enough to really evoke you know, often enough to really call it a, a even a Lovecraftian style horror story, which is not to say it's not a good story. I just, if you're really looking for a frozen wasteland horror story, I'm not sure you're gonna like. I suppose you could make it that, you know, but but I don't know that, that it's already there. Well, so certainly isolation is sort sort of what's on offer here. And that's a classic horror element. I mean, uh, isolating the PCs with no hope of outside help is a little too standard in D&D for that to automatically be horrifying. I suppose, yeah. But I think if a DM has a sense of how how to play it up, especially by not isolating them as much in the early going and then increasing the feeling of isolation and absence of outside help as things go along, then maybe you could get there. Okay. The, um, the adventure does something that bothered me in Tomb of Annihilation, and now we get some of it again. Okay. 
and it's it's uh, NPC hanger-ons mm. with the party. Mm. Not just Tomb of Annihilation. Yeah. Uh, 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 Out of the Abyss did that heavily. Um, it, Descent into Avernus does that to a degree, at least for the first several levels. Oh, oh yeah, with Lulu it does well, that. Well, I don't even think about Lulu. I was thinking about I, Rhea and, and all that, yeah. I'm a big... That's a big pet peeve of mine. I just hate it. <laughs> I just hate it. Let us be heroes and get out of my way. You know, right. and I hate giving something else for the DM to have. Well, to right, worry that's about. that's my bigger issue is that I'm the, I'm always the DM, and I hate having yeah. to have a DM PC because it's an NPC that I, that yeah. they have to have come along. I don't I, hate I, I I don't anticipate necessarily hating it for Lulu because I imagine she just sort of hangs back and doesn't do much most of the time. But um, we'll see. Well, she's not supposed to. Uh, right, but that's how I'll run her. Because it's easier for me instead of I, yeah, I already have to track campaign, all the monsters. In my campaign, she she turned into a balloon basically. It was just floating back there, and nobody paid attention right. to her. Uh, whatever. Well, and and on, you know, I I run into the I ran into the same thing uh, in my current Curse of Strahd game. Uh, the the players themselves are eventually like, look, we gotta yeah. just find some way to unload Arena. Like, I don't care where we leave her; nowhere is safe. We gotta just find some way to to get rid of her because I'm sick of babysitting this girl, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, to, to talk about a little bit about the horror aspect of it, I, I, I kind of feel the same way. I feel like they oversold that right. a little bit because, again, the adventure being so modular that if you choose to not even go to that part of the city, uh, that part of the adventure, I'm sorry, where the city is because you happen to take care of the problem early and your players are like, no, we're not going to go there, mm -hmm. then you never really experience that whole part of it. Um, and even that horror aspect doesn't really tie to... The Frost Maiden herself, right? Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be kind of the... the, the Although, the there is a... I mean, there's a, a fairly... I think it could be a fairly scary uh, bit there, wherein if you don't actually, like, get rid of Oral when you go to her home, um, that there's this, there's this bit, as I recall, where she shows up in Chapter 7, and she's like haunting you from within the, the the city and doing things uh yeah. that, that can be pretty frightening um yeah so so that's a thing um but that that's a lot of what ifs you know <laughs> um again i just i feel like the structure is is chapters are out of order here i do kind of wish that like if there was something you needed in the netherese city in order to take on oral and then the oral chapter was at the end i think suddenly the whole thing starts making a lot more sense and i can tie a, a more cohesive narrative to the whole thing i think you're right i mean if out of order just moving chapter five to the end uh i think solves a lot but then you have to make sure the challenge is appropriate because chapter five as written is for seventh level characters and chapter seven is for ninth and above which which brings me to another mm -hmm. another point uh Experience points aren't even like a thing in this adventure. They're they're completely, they're completely gone. It's all assumed like level, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, milestone leveling. And then yet there's parts where the adventure will call out if your players aren't ready for this section, have them uh, face some other encounters. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, if if experience points are gone, why <laughs> right. wouldn't they be ready? Why would I be? Aren't you deciding when they're ready? Well, and, and yeah, so I mean, I think that's a, that's a little bit of a nod to those people who are still going to make experience points be a thing. Um, personally, I'm a fan of milestone experience, and, and I'm happy with doing that and getting rid of experience points entirely anyway. Um, but that's my preference. I, I don't need to voice that on anybody else. Uh, I think I and I also imagine that a little bit as like, okay, so your players have gone through. A couple of the quests in Chapter One in, in Ten Towns, uh, and but they got a hook, and they're kind of interested in it going out far away and exploring something where they got no business level wise being there, um, and that's where the, the advice of you know maybe throw a few other encounters at them, keep them busy, uh, whatever, don't let them run into this thing because because you're not ready in the story to level them up yet. So we do XP in my game, by the way. Yeah, stop it. Like Jeez. Do you roll for hit points too? <laughs> Uh, I think we, uh, no, I give him. I roll for I roll for hit points because I think it's more fun. <laughs> oh. My my, uh, my I, I 
Kid of the my, my, my youngest yeah. son rolled ones for both level two and level three. He was so far behind. Uh, it was miserable. <laughs> but now he's better. <laughs> yes, yes, you just summarized why I don't right. do that. Right I love there. people. I love my Congratulations. players. That's neither here nor there. So, so let me ask you guys a question now. I'll, 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 yeah. I'll ask a question now real quick. How do you feel? Do you feel that this book, if I'm a new DM and I pick up this book and I open it for the first time, my first DMing experience, this is an easy book to DM. What's your thoughts? Hmm. So I think you're on really good footing uh, through chapters mm-hmm. one and two. Just I think that that's probably really well supported. And what I particularly like is that there are a bunch of really significant uh, areas that could easily eat up a, a whole session in uh, chapter two where there's no combat. You're, you're here to interact with something, but there's nothing to stab. And that's great, actually. Yeah, no, I th- I th- in fact, I think I would go even further than that. I think... Um... I think this is this runs fairly would would run fairly well levels one through through seven right till you get to that chapter five and you're dealing with oral it's it's the afterwards stuff with the Nethery city that feels disjointed and disconnected and and maybe and by then you've you know you've been running probably for months and maybe you've got some ideas about how to transition into that that those next few chapters um, but the the modularity of it I think is in many ways. Um, easier to DM because you can just sort of focus on one little chunk of of the story at a time, um, and then and then move on to the next little chunk. Uh, and so I think my my you know it's hard for me to put myself in the perspective of of as a new DM because I haven't been a new DM in thirty years. Um, but I I would think that that modularity might make it extra friendly to DMing for, as, for the first time. What are, you, what are you thinking about it, newbie? I'm looking at the... So the first thing I... When I when I opened the book, the first thing that struck me was the difference in tone with the two starting quests, hmm. right? So one quest is a typical murder hobo thing where you got to go and, you know, fight somebody. But then the other quest is a sort of like a whimsy little fetch quest almost mm-hmm. you know with a dealing with a pair of chewingas or whatever mm-hmm. that i thought was really cute and could really speak to a lot of people who play D for story reasons rather than slash and hack you know hack and slash killing things mm-hmm. reasons and right off the right off the top the book sets the tone that says e- either you like this type of gaming or this type of gaming this book and the story is for you and then within the quests there are some quests that take you in that direction or take you in the other direction, right? Because not every quest is a fighting quest. Yeah, absolutely. Go, go stab things to death quest. So I think I, I think the, and this is why I like it again, the, the, mm-hmm. the, the sandbox, the contained sandbox, again, I think makes for a great little setting for you to play in and set adventures in. But once you get to the main railroad, right. that's, where, that's where all bets are off and, and, and there's a sort of like a change in... And, and, and once you start picking up those breadcrumbs that take you from the metal dragon to the to the uh, frost maiden's uh, tower to the forbidden to the I'm sorry to the sunken city, that's where things you know take a take a weird detour and and sort of things are like wait wait a minute what's the story about really? But right. if you're playing in the sandbox of Icewind Dale and, mm-hmm. and those fun little quests, I think there's a lot of stuff there for new DMs and for DM friendly stuff. Um, and story light type of stuff, and for and for new players as well. Yeah, I think so. Because you're gonna like like Brandis had alluded to, you're going to, and, and even you alluded to in, in terms of talking about the starting quest. Like you're going to be able to experience a lot of different styles of play. Um, there's just straight up going and kill things and, and strategize your combat things, but there's also like creative combat, and there's a lot of quests that have nothing to do with combat, and uh, you know you're fighting. Uh, what is it? Uh, uh, ice wind kobolds, but you're also fighting uh, gods, and you're you're dealing with awakened animals that are going mad or whatever, right? You're, there's a lot of different types of challenges and things to deal with in the story, um, and you get a lot of variety. So I think there's there's uh, yeah, I mean I absolutely there is a lot here that um, 
in terms of setting, in terms of locations, in terms of, of modular sort of quests and, and things, there's a lot here I think that works really well. And as an open or as a contained sandbox, I think makes for a great adventure to run for uh, new DMs and for new players. So, yeah, I agree. At least that's my first impression. Again, <laughs> having not read it or not read um, it, read it deeply and not played it. Yep. The the adventure and, and I'm going to jump a little bit ahead here, but I just I got to get it out. I got to say it. The one of the possible endings to this adventure blew my mind when I when I read <laughs> <Yeah>, it. <buddy. laughs> it. It really blew my mind, and I said, "Wow, this is like this either lands with a fantastic like war amongst gaming groups, or it you know lands with a thud." And I was like, "What the hell is this? Come on!" With a groan. To me, it landed with a wow. Like I can't believe we actually got an ending like this. On a D and D adventure, mm. I thought it was fantastic. Fantastic, one of the best I've ever seen. To be perfectly honest with you, if you can get it to land, is is that something that that we're talking about new DMs? Is that something that a new DM is going to get to land? You need to. You need to. I, I think it rewards you. It rewards longtime Forgotten Realms fans. Mm. I think it rewards uh, DMs who've played through other five E adventures, and yep. I think it rewards fans of continuity. Um, I don't know if new DMs would really care too much about that, and it might throw a wrinkle in the rest of their long-term campaign uh, plans. For me, I thought it was fantastic, and, and, and I would love to see people using it in their home games. And I think it opens the door for greater things down the line if Wizards had the courage to follow up on it and, th- and run, it as a, a, run that thread through uh, later on. Yeah, it does. That would be so cool they're not gonna do that because (laughs) that would be bananas but that would be so cool um the one thing i'll say is that by the time you get to this ending you aren't a new dm anymore um you're probably having to change your your handle to journeyman dm oh sorry 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 enrique but you're no, but you're not a, a realms lore master either. If you're, it's if, true, if, right? it's true. It, well, un- like, unless you, unless you take the time out and you, and you become one, which, uh, you know, it, it's quite possible, and and all the information is out there for you well, to do so. Right, and I, I was actually really surprised that they didn't s- specifically name check the products you need to go buy off the DMs Guild <laughs> to follow up on this, guys. That is the easiest upsell literally ever. Yeah. Okay. I, I just, I, my, I just was name check away. the arcane age. It's that simple. I was just, blown away. Just do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel you. Interesting. Okay. It's it's so cool though. Yeah. No, I I I hadn't looked very deeply at the the end and the epilogue section yet, but I think I know what you're talking. I've been looking feverishly as you've been t- chatting, and I think I, I get a sense of what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I could give you. Oh, the I, yeah. I, I <laughs> yeah, bet I was just yeah, yeah. There. I'm open to it now. Um, <laughs> uh, it, well, and it, it, and like he's saying, I get pays off on this. Page this mystery that's been two sixty two pays off in a mystery that's been running through yeah the the year of chilled yeah. marrow. It, so it pays off in something that's been running through the adventures, like since we've been in five E mm-hmm. adventures, um, the whole obelisk thing starts to starts to pay off. Mm-hmm. Like that's wild. There's there's a lot but, of things that they've sort of hinted at and, and teased at and they've done never done more than sort of loose threads and cameos uh threading adventures together um i would like to see something that you know like um and correct me if i'm wrong but it, it's a little astounding to me that that you have a a story about everlasting winter and the ring of winter isn't a major component of it even though they've been hinting at it for you know years now and and it's been showing up places for years now yeah, so. fair. Let, let, let me ask you guys a question because this, this came to mind to me when I was reading the epilogue. Would you be surprised if because of this epilogue and because they wrapped up the storyline with the obelisks, which was kind of like a running thread throughout certain... Would you be surprised if they're putting a bow on the Forgotten Realms with this and maybe we're ready to move on to something else? I mean, I, I, here's here's what I know. Um, I predicted years ago 
that they would eventually be building towards a Planescape adventure that was an homage to the Great Mojan March because that's another thing that they've been lacing in and hiding throughout all of the, a lot of the early adventures. And then in the last couple of years, those those little hints kind of completely disappeared, and so now I'm not sure that that I think maybe they've dropped that. So so I guess my point is. Um, I wouldn't want to predict on these kinds of things because I've been wrong the only time I've tried. Uh, guys, guys, you know what they're name checking here, right? It's not Planescape. They're name checking Spelljammer, right. and I say that unironically. But the, the, there's an Autoloid in the adventure. It's it's the second. It's at least the second yeah. Spelljamming vessel that we've seen in in the adventures because there's the one in Mad Mage. Oh no no! Right, but I think. But I think they put that in because remember the trailer to Baldur's Gate three, oh. the video game. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I yeah, think they're making yeah, you familiar they're, with what they are. So yeah, of course they're like capitalizing on, you know, tr- transmedia recognition. Of course they are. Like, right. why wouldn't they? Um, I'm just saying, like, two ships in, we're starting to get a little serious. Uh, well, two, two ships and the upcoming Baldur's Gate three, right? Right, uh, but we had wait, we had more than than two uh, actual Mojans running around in places talking about having been separated from the Great Mojan March, and every WizKids uh, set coming with Mojans in it for no inex- no explicable reason. So um, that doesn't you know, just because it's been hinted at doesn't mean that they'll end up abandoning it and it won't go anywhere. Who knows? So yeah, yeah. I'm gonna say just just one thing that will be a totally different joke. To music fans and Planescape fans, Primus sucks. <laughs> I don't think I agree with that as either. <laughs> okay, good. I, if you if you don't agree with me, you may not get the okay. joke. <laughs> okay, that's all right. I love you, man. <laughs> I'm I'm good with not getting the joke. Okay. Um. So. I think we're 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 approaching the hour. Does anybody have any last thoughts before we throw it to questions from the stream, or can we go ahead and, and go there? No, I think my last thoughts are, or my closing thoughts are. It's a like I said at the beginning. I think we're. I think this book changes the way they present adventures, while continuing the idea that you know the book isn't just an adventure book. It's also like a mini setting book that you could use for other stuff down the line but i think this changes the way they present both the setting and the adventure taking their best practices from the essentials box but i do think that the lay the the structure of the adventure is a little um is is a little odd to me but disjointed um, in places and the way that this disjointed in places and the, and the structure itself the way it's the way you get from point a to point c to me is is not perhaps the way that I that I would have assumed that I would assume it okay. should be, but I don't design adventures, so what do I? Know? So uh, we haven't really touched on uh, the vastness of Appendix C creatures, which I think True. deserves at least. A and, high and, I, and it not only part of the book's not only value. because it's a huge collection of, of creatures which are are interesting and cool uh, I, I think I count 52 creatures yeah, but w- they also did another weird thing they put the player stats for was it Goliath in yep. the monster section instead of in the character creation section and I'm not sure what I think about that <laughs> uh, well and like Things get really, really crazy in Chapter 7 in terms of magic. Mm. Like, we haven't really been able to touch on that, but there are new spells here, and there are new creatures here. I'm just going to say, seeing the Blade of Disaster as a ninth level spell did my heart good, because I remember it from 2nd edition, and I, I absolutely love the Black Blade of Disaster spell. I only barely remember what it does anymore or what it did back then, but the name stuck with me as the coolest damn thing. And so, now it's a living spell, and so good right. luck, bro. <laughs> like, you're probably hosed. It's a living And there are spell. a handful it's of um, 
magic items and wizard spells ex- specifically that are new to the adventure as well. Um, there yeah. is a, um, you know, it, what was it in, in um, Descent into Avernus? There was a a sort of character building mechanic uh, around a dark secret, sort of a, a, a group building mechanic around a dark secret. Um, this has a, a secret element to it as well, where you can pull secrets, and they're not necessarily dark secrets. Um, you know, some of them are like, you're the biggest Drist fanboy in the world, and, and, and you, you, know, you just love being up here in Icewind Dale where he hung out and that kind of stuff. Um, but they do have this secrets mechanic, and it's not necessarily team building, but it is background building, and and um, and they're, they're they play out fairly well. They're they're on cards, and you photocopy them and cut them out, and then everybody picks one, and um, you know, it's a thing that they that I think they've evolved from what they've done in some previous adventures. Did you enjoy using the secrets in Avernus? Because mine disappeared right after we created them. They never came up in the game again. Uh, the secrets yeah. in Avernus have been relevant so far as, as they're in Baldur's Gate. Because their secret is, is of course, very um, Baldur's Gate connected. I expect that they will completely disappear as soon as they leave. So. Yeah. So. I think it is now time, um, and Steal Your Mind in the chat has gotten a head start on this, but it is time to take questions from the, um, from the chat of folks who are watching on the stream. Remember that if you are following us on Twitch, uh, then you are, will, at the end of the month, be entered to win a big bundle full of awesome dice from Skull Splitter Dice. Uh, and if you ask a question about Rhyme of the Frost Maiden right now during this stream, I will be jotting down the names of folks who uh, who are asked questions about the book, and you will not only get your question answered uh, by um, two very intelligent people and myself, uh, but you will also uh, be entered once again to to win that dice bundle here um, right now. So I hope. So, so Jeff, you're gonna you're gonna make a list and check it how many uh, times? At least seven times. Oh, I was hoping. Yeah. For <laughs> I know you are. Yeah, to find yeah. out who's naughty and who's nice. <laughs> yeah, Steal Your Mind had already asked a question about new spells, and Enrique is in the chat telling him that that there are three new spells. One of them is ice based, uh, and it's a first level um, spell. So. Uh, other questions from folks in the Twitch stream. Um, this is your chance. Ask your questions, and we will talk about them. Hopefully, I've I've vamped enough, but um, you'll also be entered once again in for a chance to win. Uh, so we have one here from Ready J Twenty Four. What would you recommend I tell my players who have already started thinking about character creation for this adventure? Um, honestly, I might. And this is just me. I might seriously start planning my character after I have my secret, mm. if the GM is using secrets, and and lean all the way into that as a centerpiece of the character, because I think that could be well. Really and cool. some of the secrets lean into that well, um, and some of them I think it would be a little bit like like I don't know that I can build an entire character around. I'm a big Drist fanboy, right? Um, Coward. <laughs> I mean, I suppose I can. I just don't know that I'm interested in playing that character. I, I don't mind. I wouldn't that's, hate having that secret, but building fair. an entire character around that would would be a little not what I want to play. Um, but there are some others where you know there there are some secrets that are pretty like, oh, this is like potentially devastatingly huge, right? Uh, for yeah. for player yeah, dynamics yeah. and party dy- dynamics. I think, and I think considering the... My advice on this is the same as it is for a lot of adventures. Like, the players and the DM need to have a conversation about what the story is about and where it's taking place and who you are supposed to be in that place. And that should inform character creation. Not necessarily the mechanical part of character creation, but... Um, but the 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 role playing part of character creation. Enrique, do you have a thought? Yeah, I I would almost take a session to even before we do character creation. It could be a part of it, but, but a session zero where you're talking about the setting, and you're talking about the little towns that make up ten towns, 
and you're talking about what each town is like and why your character may want to be from this town and not that town and 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 really try to tie yourself to the setting as presented because one they've taken the time to create a pretty robust little living setting that it would be a shame if it went by the wayside because people didn't feel the need to to really right. tie themselves yeah to I, 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 oh, and, and, and I really think you would be doing the adventure a disservice if you didn't take advantage of that. Yeah, I, I struggle with this a lot because I have I have my group of players uh, who who I adore um, are also really they they enjoy making characters and so you know we're halfway through Curse of Strahd and they're already building their their next characters for the next campaign and I'm like yeah but like I haven't told you what the story like what kind of characters to make or what how they're going to fit and whatever like uh, I love the idea of a session zero where everybody comes in with no character and we build a build the party there um, I just don't know that I can get them to rein themselves in and not do that <laughs> yeah, like like what, one of my favorite NPCs in, in the book one of my favorite NPCs in the book is a they call the leaders in the towns the the callers I think the term they use is the, mm -hmm. the town caller um, or town speaker I don't remember maybe speaker but one of my favorite NPCs is a dragonborn was one of the speakers in one of the ten towns, and they, they write him up as this kind of like, you know, this guy, who, this old dragonborn who's basically, he's seen too much shit, and now he's, you know, he drinks right. a lot, and he's kind of like a surly guy. I and yeah. and I, I found him really appealing when I was reading him. I'm like, this guy looks like a fun guy to play, uh, but he also looks like he might be a fun guy to play against or like be or, or role play with. You know, so I think it would be cool for players to know what the available things are for them to be a part of, and that may inform right. their decision as to what they want to be. And I think as a GM, you should really take the time to present all those options to the players uh, and not just say, here's 10 towns, they're called blah, 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 right. where are you from? I think you, gotta, I think you should devote the time to, to, to set up the world Right. properly to get the players invested in i usually like to get or at least i found in my last uh campaign as i started i liked giving my players like here's a one page uh summary of sort of the setting and some npcs and some hooks and some factions and and that way they have a little something i figure if i go much longer than that they're gonna lose interest and not really read it so uh we should move on though uh evil john wants to know are there any new player backgrounds uh and i don't believe there's any new ones but page 13 has a section on, like, here's existing backgrounds and how they can sort of be tweaked to be uh, Icewind Dale specific. Is that fair? Yep. Yep, I think yeah. that's, that's very cool. Um, they're, they're trying to give you stories that, in a lot of cases, connect you to other parts of the realms. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot of... That, that same kind of um, I came here because I, I can't be anywhere else right. um, type of character that you might see in a story about um, the Alaska Gold Rush. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, that's, that's kind of the sense of it. Um, I mean, I haven't read a lot of stories, admittedly, that were set in... Um, uh, Scandinavia, but sure, I guess right. you could do that too. I mean, okay, in fairness, um, in uh, Antonio Banderas' character in 13th Warrior it is a little bit of that, and that does mm -hmm. fit here. So, uh, Ranger Sierra 11 says they live in Buffalo and loves the idea of a wintry feel to an adventure. Is there enough in the book to convey that? Environmental effects, blizzards, frostbite rules, that kind of stuff. Uh, my first instinct is yes. Um, there's a lot of sort of environmental effects. There's a lot of survival as you travel through Icewind Dale, uh, especially in, the, in chapters 1 and 2, particularly in chapter 2. Um, there's, you know, climb the mountain in the middle of a blizzard sort of thing going on. There's, there's that kind of stuff. I know as a DM, um, if, if that kind of feel is not a goal I'm specifically looking for, I tend to like forget to talk about and do those things a lot of times, but it's there. It, I think it's there. And, and if that's a feel you're going for, the book absolutely, I think supports that. Is that fair? I, I think... If you're looking for wintry stuff, there's a very robust set of wilderness survival rules 
in the book. Uh, if you look at page mm. 10, 11, 12, you'll get rules for avalanches, you'll get rules for blizzards, uh, extreme cold, ice fishing, falling in frigid water, uh, overland travel in the snow, mm -hmm. mountain travel, uh, all that sort of things, uh, snowshoe rules, dog sledding rules. There, there's all sorts of, there, there's even uh, sporting rules to play sports in, mm -hmm. in the winter. Uh, and they have a few games that, that winter games that different tribes in the mountains play that they give you rules for. So I do believe there is enough material in this book to create your own wintry thing without needing it to be set in Icewind Dale or, or whatever. Yes. All right. I think in that case, we have exhausted the four questions that we received. Uh, and I think we're, we're good to wrap this up unless anybody else has something they desperately want to say. Uh, I, I think it's fair mentioning that the book comes with a poster map, a double-sided mm -hmm. poster map with a map of Icewind Dale on one side and the Ten Towns on the mm -hmm. other side. Uh, if you um, want the, for those of you in the stream, I can pull out the, I have the, the dice set as well that we kind of talked about at the beginning. And, and I did want to want to highlight one more part of the book we haven't spoken about, which I think is worth highlighting, and that's Chris Perkins' afterword yeah. at the end of the book. Yeah, so I, I did want to mention that. I'm yeah, I think like this, up. Is, this is like the first to my recollection, it's the first time, uh, in 5th edition at least, that the 5e book actually acknowledges the time we're living in mm -hmm. right now. Uh, and it sort of dates itself uh, in that regard, right? So Chris goes out of his way to mention the pandemic and the isolation that many people are living under pandemic and, and the themes of the book and how it all sort of ties together with this book. And, and I, thought it was a nice, I thought it was a nice thing to include in a book that you normally don't get that, that breaking of the fourth wall mm -hmm. like that. I thought was a welcome, was a welcome uh, thing to have in the book, and he thanks the creators and the art director and whatnot. I, I just thought it was a nice, nice mm -hmm. piece of text. That he yeah, because they, they they I mean they usually they oftentimes have had sort of these openings, uh, you know, prologues or forwards or whatever. But but this is the first time you've really had that kind of um, that kind of bit here at the at the end. Uh, and, it, and it was uh, a little, nice little piece. We do have one more question that came in late, and I'll go ahead and count it if, we got if you guys are okay with taking the time to answer it. Of course. Uh, which NPC in the adventure would be best to try and shut down the youth center of a bunch of plucky, underprivileged Tin Towns teens? Then you're running a Scooby-Doo <laughs> version of the story. <laughs> Uh, I don't know that I know. I, I feel so, like I know the NPCs well enough to, to say. Yeah, we don't we don't really know them well enough yet. But uh, look for the town with uh, one snowflake of friendliness, and you're, you're probably off to the races. Um, well, you gotta move that down, Enrique. We can't see. Yeah, I, I realize. <laughs> and now it's out of focus. Trying. I don't know what you're trying to show us. I'm trying to show Travis oh. the the dragonborn. Never the, mind. the the drunken dragonborn. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but mind. I but I also think like in in, in a, as a serious answer I think um, the conversation we had about lacing in the the machinations and the larger goals towards the the Nethery city of the Arcane Brotherhood um, could be a place of like I think if that if you make them and their machinations uh, a little bit more of um, of of a of a obstacle early on then it helps sort of build that animosity to the point that later on when you find out they're they're going to this nethery city that maybe the pcs will be more likely to be like yeah that's total, totally something we need to go and get in their way because because screw those guys so also i do just want to point out that i know that the question was referencing uh break in and break in two electric boogaloo oh. and not in fact uh scooby-doo as my estimable uh, I don't know. That sounds kind of that sounds pretty Scooby Dooish to me. But but you're right. Plucky, underprivileged, uh, Tin Towns teens is is probably something I'm not gathering. L listen, the um, by the way, the um, the snowflake ratings. Uh, two things on that. One, uh, very clever. That's going to spark a lot of jokes at the table. Uh, you know how many snowflake ratings do you uh -huh. have? And two, uh, it reminded me a lot of the Volos guides from second edition that had the tongue cards, uh, tankards. Yep. Uh, ratings for the bars and the taverns right. and cities. Uh, each city had like a yep, three sure. or two or three tankard rating with a little icon of a of a tankard. I, it threw me back when I read that. I thought it was a yeah. pretty cool, pretty cool ad. Very good. All right. 
I am going to go ahead and call this the end of the episode. I want to say thank you to Skull Splitter Dice that you can go to skullsplitterdice.com slash tome show to get a coupon code. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank all of our listeners who support us by shopping at Amazon or DMs go through the links at thetomeshow.com or who will become our patrons at patreon.com slash uh, the tome. I think is what it is. I wrote it wrong on here. Um, such as Hyperlexic, Merrick Blackman, Jill Sanders, Leonard Pelche, Doug Palmer are all uh, fantastic patrons that we chat with there. Uh, I also want to thank our guest, Brandis. Where on the internet should people go to see more of you? Uh, I write for Tribality.com. My personal blog is BrandisStoddard.com. You can find me on Twitter at Brandis Stoddard, and I also have a Patreon. By the same it's name. Brandis ES at the end. Correct. There you go. Uh, and Enrique, um, where should people go if they want to chat with your brilliant self more on the interwebs? So you could find me at, uh, at NubiDM on Twitter. Uh, I have a website at NubiDM.com, uh, which shame on me for not updating as often as I should. And um, I think that's right. it. I'm mostly, mostly you could find me on Twitter. You are fairly prolific on Twitter, yes. I think I've actually lived, moved into Twitter. I think I live in the matrix of yeah, Twitter. Yeah, that's fair. All right, if you want to get a hold of us at the, the show, you can email thetomeshow at gmail.com. I am on Twitter as well. I am at Squatch, S-Q-U-A-C-H. Uh, the show is at The Tome Show. You can also find us on Facebook and Discord, and as has been referenced uh, for a while now, um, we also stream uh, live recordings of our episodes on Twitch at twitch.tv slash tomeshow. I think that's right. Um, so, so, yeah, so that's us. Oh, and we also have a Discord channel. Did I mention that? So, so reach out to us, and I'll send you the link to the Discord channel. We'd love to see you there. All right, so that's the that's our surprise round episode of about Frostmaiden, where we underwent uh, or we we trudged through the icy death that is Icewind Dale in this episode of the Tome, and that's the end of the episode. Pretty cool. Th- thanks awesome. for for joining me in this conversation, both of you, Enrique and Brandis, but also all of you in the stream hanging out with us. I hope uh, I, I, I enjoyed fun. having the questions and having the live chatter and having Steal Your Mind uh, uh, mess with me during the stream as he enjoys to do. And then and then posting about it in the Discord so I'm getting multiple notifications all from him talking about it, how he's messing with me. Uh, <laughs> so that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think it's time to go. Um, I, I got an email from a student today that I forgot to do something. So I need to stay up late and get that done real quick. So... Um, Thanks again. I'm going to go ahead and end the stream right now.